So I think we're going to make a start. Thanks a lot for coming back. Uh, so our final session uh, has the best speakers, I think. And uh, Bavak's going to kick us off. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for soldiering, soldiering on to the final stretch. Um, it's been really fun throughout this um, workshop. I had a great time, and I hope you did too. Um, and for today, I'll talk about two things. One is a plug for nasal microbiota because I think it's a really cool system. And then we use that system to ask um, when can we use um, blood cobalt tech models for microbial communities. So I'll try to go quickly and not waste some of your time. But before I start, I just have to tell you that most of the work is done by two graduate students in the lab, Sandra, who graduated, and um, Vishnavi, who's currently working on, the, on this project. And we had help from undergraduate students in the lab as well as our collaborators, especially Catherine Lemon, who gave us the strains and helped us establish the system in the lab. Um, so the nasal microbiota, the reason we are interested in it is that it has um, very important implications for human health uh, and respiratory health. Um, and in particular, there is Staphylococcus aureus, um, one of the species commonly found in nasal microbiota that is present in about 30% of the population. And even the antibiotic resistance is resistant, resistant version of it is present in um, many of the individuals in the population. And for most healthy individuals, they are not making any issues. They are just there like any other schmuck and not causing any damage. But if the immune system gets weaker or if there are um, other diseases and this becomes very important for elderly individuals or people who are going into hospitals with other diseases, um, it can become pathogenic, can cause a whole bunch of nasty um, infections throughout the body. And because antibiotic resistance is a major issue for Staphylococcus aureus, treating it is especially hard. So roughly we'll, in the US, we get about 120,000 invasive infections and about 20,000 deaths per year. Um, Fortunately, there seems to be this interaction between other microbes in that environment that affect um, Staphylococcus aureus. And our interest in the system comes from this as well. So um, we are asking ourselves, can we use these ecological notions to use other members of the community as a way of restructuring the community, reducing the level of Staph aureus and protecting patients that, are, that could potentially be at risk. But perhaps more importantly for us, our interest comes from this relatively low diversity in the nasal uh, microbiota. So if, um, this is work from Catherine Lemon's lab, and they have looked at the species across the human population and essentially counted how often you would see a specific species um, and what's their relative abundance. And if you look at the number of reads, you see that um, a handful of species account for the majority of reads in that environment. So. Overall, if you go up to 20 species, you can account for 90% of the reads. So these are the major players in this environment. Even more, if you look at individual individuals, so any, any given person, and look at the composition of their microbiota, 90% um, of cases, you can, you can explain most of the um, microbes in that environment using a handful of species. Somewhere between three to eight species are enough to um, say who is present, who is dominant in that environment. So it's a very, or maybe not very, but relatively low diversity environment as far as um, um, human microbiota goes. So nothing comparable to oral cavity or even worse than um, the gut microbiota. And that's the main point of interest for us that we see that there are these uh, bunch of species, if you get isolates from them, put together relatively small communities of a, of a few species. These are not too far from what happens um, out there in nature. And these species, most of them are also relatively easy to culture, but they are aerobic. They are easy to grow in the lab. They grow with normal, under normal um, lab environment pretty well. Um, and that's the reason that we've picked this system up and we think that it would be a good system to look into ecology in general and um, but today I'm going to talk about you is the lotka type in, um, um, equations in particular. So these have been throughout history, one of the major ways that people have been um, um, looking into uh, population dynamics in ecology. And in this workshop, you've already seen many examples of it that people have used um, mostly successfully to show that how they will be relevant and helpful. 
Um, and the history of it is coming from 1920s and 1930s when people were looking at um, prey predator populations in nature and later using microbial systems as well in, for competition. And there are several advantages. The main one is that we don't really need to know what the mechanism of interaction is. And that's a, that removes one of the major burdens. You can just look at how populations grow together and get an estimate of what the interaction coefficients are without working too hard to figure out who's producing what and how it's potentially affecting another uh, microbe in the same environment. Um, these interaction coefficients are also easy to, par to parameterize. You can take these populations, grow them together, and as long as you can follow the population sizes, you can get a pretty good estimate of um, the interaction coefficient. And there are some empirical support for it, which sort of makes us more comfortable thinking that this could potentially work. Um, and they're easy to extend to multi-species communities. You can just measure the pairwise interactions and build a network out of those pairwise interactions if you need to go to more, more number of species. Um, so we've asked ourselves if um, these types of modeling would work well for microbes. We work with microbes and we want to know if we can use these models that have been prevalent in ecology for our particular systems. So a few years ago um, with Wen Ying and Li in her lab, we looked into um, the situations that um, local vulture type models might work or might fail. And we did this sort of simple idea. We started from some a mechanistic model of um, interactions through metabolites in the environment as our ground rules. Um, and then we built um, its equivalent LV model to the, base, to the best of our um, knowledge. So we tried our best to make a corresponding Lotkov ultra type model for them. And then we compared the dynamics between the two models to see when Lotkov ultra type models would work and when they wouldn't. And it, would, it was easy to see in that situation that you don't have to work too hard. It's pretty easy to find situations that local ultra type models won't work for uh, microbial interactions. And I'm giving you two examples here. One is that you can imagine these two simple cases that S1 is producing a chemical that affects S2 without um, S2 having a major impact on that intermediate chemical. Or the other situation that maybe this one is producing some metabolite that the other one is consuming and also benefiting from it. And even in these two simple cases, so this could be a change in pH, for example, this could be um, cross-feeding through some metabolites. So these are things that you, you would normally see in your microbial communities. And even in these simple examples, um, one thing that comes up is that the number of recipients in this, in this case matters because the mediator has to be distributed among the recipients. Whereas in the other case, the number of recipients doesn't matter. No matter who's present, if there is a change in pH, everybody will be affected. Um, so as you can imagine, um, the equations that would describe this situation would depend on the population of S2, and in this case, they wouldn't depend on the population of S2. So a single Lotka ultra type model, you wouldn't expect it to work in this situation. Um, and the other cases are mostly indirect interactions that um, it's, again, easy to imagine one is producing some metabolite that affects more than one species, and if one of those species consumes those, that metabolite, it's essentially changing the pairwise interaction for the other pair. And that's something that's not included in the standard Lotka Volter model. You can go to higher order models and try to capture that, but uh, it's an extra work that most often um, we won't do. So then we asked ourselves, should we just say goodbye to LV models and move on with our lives and find something else that works better? And we had these sort of contradictory um, information from the literature. In some examples, Lotka Volter type models seem to work well. There are, um, I've, put a couple of examples here, but there are more than that. And in some other examples, people report that it fails. So we asked ourselves, can we, are there conditions that they would work and conditions that they would fail? And for that, we are using our in vitro nasal communities that we can easily grow and um, examine to see, um, can we figure out what's important and what's not? Everything makes sense so far? Right. So the experiments that we do are the most basic um, experiments that one can imagine. We take one species, we grow them up to saturation, we take the cell free um, filtrate, and then we ask how the other species uh, grows in that environment. We call them people's assay because it's something that everybody can do. You don't need to be uh, from elite labs or have any particular equipment to run this. As long as you can measure population densities over time for a monoculture, you're good to go and, um, and do these experiments. <clears throat> 
But something that comes up from um, lutko volter models is that if you measure the growth rate and carrying capacity in the superintent of some other species, the ratio of those two parameters will be similar to that ratio for the monoculture. Um, I talked with um, um, Michael a few days ago and he suggested that I should explain why this happens. I go through a few lines of derivation. It's pretty straightforward. Um, so you can imagine starting from the standard lotka volterra model. This is the um, rate of change in the population, growth rate of the population one, um, its carrying capacity in monoculture, and then the effect of um, population um, species two on population one. So what we want to do is to look at growth in the cell-free spent media, which means instead of S2, we'll we've let it go to saturation. So we re replace S2 with K2 in, in our equations. So this would be how S1 grows in the supernatant of S2. And the things that we measure, one of them is the growth rate in early exponential phase, which would be just ignoring this term because S1 will be very small. So you will end up with um, the growth rate in the supernatant to be equal to growth rate in monoculture times this factor which depends on the species two and its influence. And then the carrying capacity in the supernatant is when the population reaches saturation. So we set this um, um, derivative to be zero and just do the calculations, it's simple arithmetic, and we end up with this. And you can already see that the ratio of these two, um, this term cancels out and it ends up to be um, the ratio in the, in the monoculture that we, we had started with. So this is a, a little bit peculiar because it says no matter what in the, what your species two is, you will end up with the same ratio. But it, we thought that it, it would be also a good signature to ask, because if lotka volterra is valid, then we expect this ratio to be fixed in, um, in our experiments. So we use that as a criterion to decide whether lotka volterra is good enough or not. If this ratio is fixed, we can't say that lotka volterra will work. But if it's not, we can for sure say that it's probably not a good idea to, to use lutka volterra for, for our model. And then we started by looking at uh, what we get in our system. And here the um, medium that we're using is 10% THY. So THY is one of the standard rich, medium, rich media that people use for growing um, microbes. And we reduce it by tenfold because when we compare it with the composition of um, nasal environment, that more or less corresponds to 10% THY. And in that environment, we grew different species in the supernatant of other species. So the name on top is the species that we are testing and the colors are where, where the um, spent media is coming from. And um, maybe I'll orient you with one of these examples. The, um, Y-axis is showing the max OD that we use as a proxy for um, overall cell density um, in, um, in saturation. And then the X-axis is the growth rate in early exponential phase. And these lines are to helping, hopefully helping you to guide your view. And we see that there are maybe a few exceptions here and there, but by far um, overall, the trend seems to hold. And what it's telling us is that maybe in the typical medium that we are using, 10% THY, um, maybe lotka volterra is not such a bad idea. We did the same experiments with 100% um, THY. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Maybe first this one. So we asked ourselves whether the nutrient availability was the major point in, um, in that situation. So a very simple idea is that other species are taking up some of the nutrients from the environment. So if you put something in that environment, it will, it will grow to a less um, extent, or maybe some other species add some helpful nutrient to the environment and you would grow more in that environment. But all of that is just the availability of nutrients in the environment. And when, when we check that by just diluting our media, so rather than doing anything else, we can just dilute the media and ask how the different species grow in that, that environment. And we see that the linear trend still holds. So everything is consistent with this very simple view of other species either Exp adding to that niche or taking away from that niche and everything would, would, um, would still hold um, along the same, in the same uh, line. But when we check the same thing in, um, in rich, rich medium, which would be 100% THY and um, things that are richer than 10%, we see that the trend doesn't hold anymore. So this is telling us essentially that if you go to rich medium, um, 
both cobalt sulfate type models probably won't work, at least with the microbes that we are looking at and with these environmental conditions. And uh, thinking about it would be very simple. If something is re removing some of the nutrients from the environment, the properties don't uh, move along that line. So everything is not consistent with load cobalt type modeling anymore. If they don't satisfy those equations, we don't expect them to um, represent the dynamics um, at the end of the day. And then we tried a whole bunch of carbon sources, um, organic acids, amino acids, and, uh, and antibiotics. And the idea was that we asked ourselves, does this trend that we see would hold when we change single parameters in the environment? Because presumably those are how microbes are interacting with each other. Maybe one microbe is producing some acetate in the environment, and that added acetate would change the environment for the other species. And we asked ourselves, does it, does magically everything um, align on that line is still. And it doesn't. I'm showing just one example here for the sake of time, but you can see that you can get different trends in some ways in this direction, sometimes in that direction, um, for this example of acidic acid. And the same pattern holds for other um, mediators that we tried individually. So here we are changing just one parameter at a time and looking at how that changes the, the properties, and that doesn't stay on that line anymore. And overall, we see compound dependent and species dependent responses. So things will sort of jump in random directions based on what compound we are using and how that particular species responds to that compound. And the view that we get from here is, um, so this is a lot of speculation, but this is sort of what we have come up with to try to explain what we see in, this, um, in, um, in, in, in our experiments. So our simple imagination is that we have these carrying capacity and growth rate um, axes, and we can define the habitat quality along this line, which is going through the normal growth in the, um, in the monoculture. And when you change a single parameter in the environment, let's say because of some microbial activity, there will be more acetate in that environment, and this microbe responds in this way to the presence of acetate. And for other other changes, for example, pH changes, and there will be some other change, and um, maybe glucose concentration changes, and there will be a third shift. And you have all of these small effects, not small in size, but um, these random effects that affect the cell in different directions, but overall the net property is still going back to nutrient availability or resource availability as the major driver of how microbes are responding to each other in relatively low nutrient environment. If you go to rich environments, then this doesn't hold anymore because there will be plenty of um, nutrients around. There will be other um, traits and um, dependencies to deal with. But in low nutrient environments, you can still go back to this very simple idea of there are a whole bunch of things happening. There, is, there are uh, microbes that respond to nutrient availability, and then depending on that, you will get um, how their growth rate and carrying capacity change. And in some way, the way we are thinking about it is that we are going from a very complex situation of having all these random effects from random um, chemical compounds in, in the environment to a simple effect of moving along this habitat quality axis. And I think of it sort of conceptually sim similar to diffuse optics. So it's really hard to simulate the scattering from a single scatterer. It's a sort of famously hard um, um, problem to solve. And if you have two scatterers, it's still very hard and it even gets harder. But if you have many small scatterers throughout your system, then things become simpler. You can just shift your view and just use diffuse optics to find the solution in that environment without really tracing individual um, effects of individual scatterers in the system. So we also ran um, co-culture experiments to see whether this holds. So we have come up with this model of what cobalt type model, and we wanted to see if it is relevant at all or not. All of these are coming from um, spent media. So we put two species, Staph aureus and Staph uh, um, epidermidis, I call it here, Staph non aureus, um, in the same environment. We let them grow together. Um, our Staph aureus um, has a fluorescent label, and we use that to get its abundance. And then from the total population size, we um, infer what the um, population abundance of a staph non aureus is. And when we do this, um, we get traces that are not exactly on, um, on the actual experimental data. So the experimental data are the solid lines. The dotted lines are what we get from um, our spent media assays. And the um, dashed lines are Lotkov ultra type models fit into the actual experimental data. And you can see that our estimates are not perfect, but they qualitatively follow what we see in our experiments. 
And when we compare the um, interaction coefficients, again, in all of these, we are looking at relatively poor nutrient environment and the interaction coefficients, both in um, sign and in relative magnitude are more or less aligned with what we see in our, um, in our actual exper co-culture experiments. We did the same thing with rich medium and it turns out um, our results are pretty much garbage. So what we get from CFSM has no relevance to, um, to co-cultures in rich medium. Um, both in terms of sign and uh, magnitude. So we, our estimates from um, lotko Volter are very small interactions, whereas we see relatively strong interaction in the actual experiments, which is sort of confirming what we expected. It wasn't supposed to work for rich medium, and it doesn't. And it's supposed to work to, for um, poor nutrient medium, and it does. So I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Uwek. Questions? Chris? Can you define what rich versus poor medium is? That's a very great question. Um, I, we can't define it globally for everything. Um, it will be system dependent. For our um, species and our, uh, our set of species and our uh, media type, it was around 10% THY, but it's sort of a cyclic definition that you have to test out your um, um, your strains see at what point that sort of trends falls off track, and then that would be your definition of rich versus poor nutrient. Jeff? You start telling us that the community consists only about eight or nine species, so as an alternative to look couple there, you could also develop a genetic model and then compare the two. Is that something that you want to pursue? Because it's doable, right? If you don't have too many species, right? Right, I think it's doable and it's something that we are moving towards. We are trying to figure out what the interaction mediators are and make a more mechanistic version of the model. Um, the reason we are attracted to these types of models is, is that they are very simple and very easy to, um, to build. So we make very little effort in building these models in the lab. And that I think there is a certain power that comes from that view of like, what is, maybe it's not a perfect way of modeling things, but can we get insight from this simple model that we can sort of, um, put together very easily. All right, one more question. Yeah, this is kind of getting back to Chris's question a little bit. So as you move from poor media to rich media, does it kind of slowly decay from this line or is there actually a pretty sharp point where it drops off of it really quick? Another good question. So the trend, um, it's a um, continuum. So usually it goes along that line and then falls off. Um, and you can easily see it. I didn't show both of the data together, but if you plot it together, you can easily see that um, there, is a, uh, there is a clear div um, deviation from that line. And there is, in the literature, there, there are explanations about what that happens. So there is a very good paper um, from Lipson, I think it's 2015 or 2016, um, that um, he has looked into why this trend might uh, might be there. All right, if Gulham uh, can get set up slowly, we're going to take one more question. Uh, I was wondering if I showed that the, I think you were measuring like the subspecies of the species, and then you showed that the subspecies of the species. No, it's pretty easy to do. So um, um, for us, the so we measure the OD um, versus GFP in monocultures, and that stays a um, pretty straight line. It deviates, and we include that correction into our into our estimates. But it's a pretty easy to um, process process to go from GFP readout to corresponding OD. So there are corrections. I skipped a lot of the details. So you have to do corrections. When the density goes up, there is an effect from that. Um, but um, yes, you can just follow the population based on the GFP in the co-culture. All right. Thank Thanks. you for all the questions. And let's thank Babak again. And uh, our next speaker is Gilham Zomaria Klein. Hopefully.